morning, saints of our Lord, and welcome to Thy Strong Word. I'm your host, Brady Finner, and pastor of Messiah Lutheran Church in Sartell, Minnesota. Thank you for tuning us in this morning on Worldwide KFUO, Christ for you anytime, anywhere. A blessed epiphany season this Thursday, February the 17th, as the light of Jesus shines on us from Matthew chapter 18. This is coming fresh off the, 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 the foretelling of Jesus about his death and resurrection. He speaks about the temple, and yesterday's study was such a blessing from Pastor Kirk Clayton as we talked about Jesus not paying the temple task, ta- tax, excuse me, points us to the free and gracious salvation we have in Christ, that, that we are adopted as his sons. He brings that all together, and what is the first question? that the disciples asked today in Matthew chapter 18. Who's the greatest? Who is the GOAT, as we often will say in football and other um, sports nowadays? The question that they're asking has nothing to do with Jesus, but they were looking at each other and saying, who's the greatest? Maybe they're a little bit off, but let's be honest. Many times we in our own narcissism are off as well. So we pray that the Lord brings us back to him today as we know that he does by his Holy Spirit when we are in his word for the gifts are ready, ready for you. Thank you to our friends at Lutheran Heritage Foundation for your support of thy strong word. Visit lhfmissions.org for more information, lhfmissions.org. Helping us to be strengthened by God's word this morning, we welcome back regular guest, Pastor Stephen Tice, vacancy pastor of Emmanuel Lutheran Church in New Wells, Missouri. Pastor Tice, happy epiphany and welcome back to Thy Strong Word. Thank you, sir. Blessed epiphany to you and to those who are joining us on the air today and those joining us online, all those folks who are able to be with us. It's a a pleasure to share God's word with each other and to be in the family of God, you know, this, this worldwide eternal family. We, we miss sometimes how big it really is because we're so constricted, most of us at least, in our exposure to it. And, and uh, one of the things we see in, in the, the readings from Matthew is that Jesus is telling his, his disciples, this is more than just about you. And it's good for mm-hmm. us to remember that the disciples, like us, went through daily life, got up, had their daily chores initially, and then they went off to school and followed Jesus around. Um, but but life wasn't simple. Life wasn't always mm. clear. You know, the, the Word of God tells us that the Lord will lead us, but he doesn't tell us he'll show us everything. And that's part of my challenge anyway. Well, yeah, Lord have mercy on all of us in that, in that light. So, so, Pastor, as we—I'll take a little bit of a setback. What's going on for you and the saints at Emmanuel? Well, we uh, just uh, this past— Sunday, the congregation had their annual fish fry. Uh, didn't have one last year, so I guess it's no longer an annual fish fry. It's a, a fish fry <laughs> on a recurring basis. <laughs> COVID, COVID realities, as they say. Um, mm. and, and I think it's important for us to remember that that's part of the truth. We assume things will always just follow the pattern they're in, and they right. won't. Yeah, mm. and, and on the other hand, the Lord is always the one who is in charge of, of each day and what happens in it. And that's, that's easy to forget. But the other thing is we're, we're continuing to have worship services. We're continuing to share God's Word. We're receiving God's gifts. And the congregation is in the call process. They're, they're preparing um, to ask for nominations uh, from the congregation, but they haven't, haven't quite gotten all the, all the ducks in a row, if you will, for that yet. But uh, we ask the uh, members of Christ's body, Pray for pastors in all places and for congregations seeking pastors in all places, too. And and that's exactly what I was going to say as far as a prayer request to our listeners is that currently in the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, we have nearly 500 congregations across the country um, searching for a pastor, calling a pastor actively, and many more who are maybe not able to afford a pastor. And so we pray to the Lord of the harvest. I mean, this is why Jesus, you know, told the disciples and reminds us that the the work is great, but the labors are few. And so we pray and give thanks for vacancy pastors like Pastor Tice. And ultimately, it's in his hands. Like you said, we, we don't even know if we'll have a fish fry next year. And so we trust the Lord that he will always provide. So, Pastor, as we go back to his word and go back to the one of whom we trust, can you begin our time in prayer? Certainly. Gracious God, you promise that before we call, you will answer while we are yet speaking, you will hear us. 
that the situation that your people faced in past times when it appeared to them that you had forgotten them was not all that it seemed to them that in fact you had remembered, but that you were waiting for the right moment. Lord, you are not slow, as some people count slowness. The apostle reminds us you are patient with us. Grant us patience with each other. Grant us patience with our daily challenges. Fill us with the peace of knowing that Christ has already overcome the world and that each thing we face in this life is a thing that passes, but that Christ's love for us and the presence of his people with the Lord is an eternal gift. Bless our time together in your word today and bless our time in service to you each day with Christ in his presence. Amen. If you have any questions concerning our text from Matthew chapter 18, we'll be doing the first nine verses this morning. Send us an email, kfuo at kfuo.org, kfuo at kfuo.org, or call us 314-821-0850, 314-821-0850. Now, Pastor, I'm going to start with reading all nine verses and coming back for your first thoughts. Now, what I challenge our listeners and challenge uh, both Pastor and I is that there's some words in here that really like, whoa, 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 what's that? And we do want to focus on them. Even Pastor Tice and I <laughs> spoke yesterday and it was kind of like, hey, we're going to talk about cutting off people's feet. Like, okay, that's not the main purpose of these verses, but they're there. And so we want to make sure that we're keeping centered on on the main message, centered on Christ and the meaning that it has for us today, knowing it is all true. So beginning in verse 1, uh, we'll read through verse 9. Reminder to our listeners, we'll be reading from the English Standard Version of Matthew 18 in the first verse. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And calling to him a child, he put him in the midst of them and said, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. Whatever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. Woe to the world for temptations to sin. For it is necessary that temptations come, but woe to the one by whom the temptation comes. And if your hand or foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life crippled or lame than with two hands or two feet to be thrown into eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out, throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into the hell of fire. These are very serious words, um, and, and we know there's a context. There is a context right prior to this. And I will remind her to our listeners tomorrow, there's a, a great study we have um, that I'm looking forward to with Pastor Koshman on the parable of the lost sheep and and how to love each other and, and, and when there are sin. And right in the middle of it is some great stuff. And you're like, wow, that's really good. And there's some stuff, whoa, what's this? So, Pastor, how do you want to make sure we're starting off on the right foot? Well, I think we, we're going to keep in context here where Jesus is. This is right after the transfiguration. Mm -hmm. He has revealed to Peter, James, and John that he is God's son. And the, the voice that spoke to him, remember, in the baptism of Jesus at the Jordan, the voice that spoke was speaking to Jesus. On the Mount of Transfiguration, the voice spoke to the apostles. And it wasn't, you are my beloved son. It's, this is my son. I have chosen him. Yeah. Listen to him. So we have this impact, if you will, that the, the focus is now shifted. And Jesus has announced after Transfiguration that he's going to Jerusalem to be handed over to the enemy. So we're now in these, these um, moments of of what I would call the, the last days before the last days begin. Uh, it might sound a little redundant or silly, but the last days we live in come after the resurrection of Christ. These are the last days of the beginning, if you will. As the disciples are hearing Jesus say, we're going to Jerusalem, I'll be handed over, I'll be crucified, and after three days rise again. And so the, the focus here is the, the events coming up are real. You need to face the real world and not think that it can be what you want it to be. And we're going to start mm -hmm. right off with this question, who is the greatest in the 
kingdom of heaven, and that's, again, one of Matthew's themes. But, but the disciples have picked up the phrase enough that they're phrasing it that way because they're hearing something and probably not hearing it right, much like me. So, And, and that's very fair because it is, it is something where um, it, it's kind of like uh, there, there's times in Matthew where they're kind of like, could this be the son of David? that they ask the question. They're asking the right questions, but they haven't quite have let the other shoe drop. And that's where we have to be very fair, fair with Peter and he, as he asks questions. And as you said, in the Mount of Transfiguration, wanted to put up tents. It's not like he is denying Jesus, but you know, it's just kind of like, okay, let's let the other shoe drop, which is why I find Jesus to be a very repetitive and patient teacher of the disciples and others um, throughout. Mm-hmm. And, and many times I, I find myself getting frustrated, but like you said so well, Pastor, is, well, you know, how about, how, let's, let's point the finger back at ourselves a little bit. You know, how many times are we just a little bit off and the Lord gently guides us? So, Pastor, anything else before we dig in? Um, I think uh, the, the recognition that, that we're going to hear some, some shocking words, and there are times when people say, well, this is Jesus using hyperbole. And, and we're going to talk about that a little bit. Is it hyperbole or is it something else? And, and then, then I'll have another answer that fits into that question. So, Got it. Okay, so let's begin. And I just want to slowly go through this. Like I said, we only have 10 verses, nine verses, excuse me, that we'll be going through today. But every verse really uh, builds off of each other and good for us to be able to dig in slowly this morning. So verse 1. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? So like you said, Pastor, that they're, uh, well, like we say this all the time in sports nowadays, and this is a relatively new term that I, I don't remember having growing up, but who is the GOAT? You know, G-O-A-T, which is mm-hmm. the greatest of all time. Now, clearly, they're not talking about Tom Brady. Um, they're not talking about, uh, you know, Michael Jordan or something along mm-hmm. those lines. But kind of kind of along those lines, as they talk about the kingdom of heaven, what, what are they asking Jesus as we read this? What they're asking is, who's, who's going to be the one in the greatest position? And part of, I think, part of what they're asking is, how do we line ourselves up to be in contention? And the other thing I think they're getting at, although they don't know it, is the Lord's using their question to actually teach about service. And so Jesus is preparing them for what's going to happen at Passover in the upper room when he washes their feet. And, and they go back to this, this question of who is the greatest. And Jesus says, I am among you as one who serves. And so we, we see this, this recurring theme and going back to Isaiah's description of the servant of Yahweh this one who then suffers for God's people. And so the idea of greatness in the eyes of the world is entirely wrong if it leaves out the spiritual dimension, and all life is spiritual. And this is, you know, an overlooked or misrepresented part of our culture. Even even in the church we get tempted to talk about, well, in the secular world. Well, no, all world is, the whole life is spiritual. There is a world that, that operates outside of the Word of God, and in Lutheran theology, we call that sometimes the kingdom of the left hand, or God's, God's uh, other part of power, but not part of his kingdom of grace. But in the life of the Christian, we need to recognize that all of life is spiritual. It's not dividable. We have this false dichotomy of physical and spiritual, of, of even in our sense of being a human being. I'm at the same time saint and sinner. We use that phrase repeatedly as Lutherans. That sounds like it's, it's a um, division into two things, but it's not. It's acknowledging that all life is spiritual. And I'm at the same time saint and sinner because I have a physical being, but that was created as a being in the image of God to start with. This is spiritual. Our bodies are spiritual, even though they're physical. And this is not a theological topic we normally get into. But in this mm-hmm. case, when we're talking about cutting off hands and poking out eyes, I think we better. Yes, we definitely need to not become Gnostics, you know, the understanding that the physical is mm-hmm. bad. That is, I mean, if there, you, you, can't, you can't read the Gospel of Matthew and the rest of the scriptures without seeing the physicalness of humanity, the physicalness mm-hmm. of God, and the physicalness of spirituality, to be honest. Um, right. And, and mm-hmm. so it's definitely a very important uh, uh, thing for us to interpret today's 
passage appropriately. And I really like what you said, and it's something I want to maybe reflect on for a moment, where you talked about... The, they're, they're like, you know, how can we be in contention for this? Kind of like if there's an election, how do I how do I get the most votes <laughs> to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And it reminds me of James. And is it James and John? I'm a little bit off. And it just came to mind right now where the mom asked Jesus, hey, what can we do yeah. to get my sons to send you right and left? Isn't that right? Yeah, it, it's uh, it's the brothers. So it's, it's uh, James and John. Yeah. Yeah, the brothers. And so there's, there's this constant, and you, you kind of think that the problem happened when we started voting. No, no, the, the, this is, this is a, a, an issue from the beginning where we want to barter ourselves for position of power um, to be considered the greatest. This is Muhammad Ali, right? Mm-hmm. I am the greatest. And it's, it's a constant theme we have that we, we sometimes think that we can just get rid of today and as if it's never been around before, but it is something that clearly we're reminded of our need for repentance. So anything else in verse 1, Pastor? Well, I think that we're looking at, at this statement, the, the kingdom of heaven. It gets back to the idea that Jesus had been teaching them that the, the reign of God, the kingdom of heaven, is at hand. And, mm-hmm. and they're mm-hmm. finally, I'm going to use the word finally buying into that, even though they don't quite know what it means. They really think after all the things they've watched Jesus doing, heard him ta- talking about, seen the reactions, and of course post-transfiguration, they are finally saying, hey, it's close, or what we think it is is close. How do we make sure we're in the right position to benefit? And I don't want to say this in a selfish way, to benefit from the reign of God as much as we can. And, and sometimes I think it's okay to say their spiritual motivation was correct, although their understanding was wrong. And sometimes it's, I want to be the greatest. Sometimes it's, well, I want to make sure I'm in. And if I'm shooting for greatest, at least I get included. But again, it's a works righteousness human default position, which is never going to get us anywhere with God. So, and this and this definitely brings us back to uh, one of the main themes that we've had had different guests say is a theme throughout this book from Matthew chapter five verse three: "Blessed are the poor in spirit." And our next few verses brings us back to that reality that. They said, who can be the greatest? And then he takes the most unexpected person and calls them the greatest, which would be, I don't want to say poor in spirit as far as, like you said, spiritually, mm-hmm. but definitely the, the least expected of, of the greatest um, that he plops right in the middle of them, which is wonderful. So let's get to that, verses 2 through 4. And calling to him a child, he put him in the midst of them and said, Truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So they ask, who's the greatest? And then he calls this Mm -hmm. little child to him, plops in the middle of him, and what does he say? Unless you turn, unless you switch, unless you reverse course, and again, the, the, the word turn here in English uh, translates a Greek word, but in Hebrew, the same word is used for repentance. The word is translated turn in English, but it's the word for repentance. And so in a sense, Jesus is actually saying what's necessary. Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. And what he's saying, they're asking about the kingdom or the reign of God, and he's saying repentance is where we've got to start, guys. <laughs> you've got to start with repentance. You've got to turn. You've got to strefo. you got to you got to change the direction you're, you're looking or the way you're walking. So this strafete is the Greek verb here. But it, it's unless you turn, if you don't turn and become like a child. Well, now we're back to John 3 in his conversation with Nicodemus. Unless one is born anew, you got to start over. Um, I was reading recently a commentary about baptism, and I think it was Robert Kolb's uh, writing. But he was saying that basically Baptism is a dress rehearsal for death and the end of the world. And, and our daily renewal of our baptism is this constant turning and becoming like a child, humbling ourselves. It's the recognition that we are doing a daily dress rehearsal to die and return in Christ at the end of the age in a body that doesn't need to ever die again. And so unless you lose focus beyond the moment, and a child lives in the moment. This is the other thing about a child, especially mm. a little kid. They live in the moment. They don't live in the six years down the road. They live in the moment. And 
and this is part of the reason they're not as patient as we'd like them to be, but it's also part of the recognition that they've, they've focused on what's happening right now. And that's partly what Jesus is calling them to. Unless you become like a child who is living in a relationship of trust, a knowing dependence, you know, I, I see this all the time with my, my own children when they were little and my grandchildren, um, but, you know, this, this uh, turning and running to the edge of the steps and jumping, and while they jump, saying, Daddy, catch me. They're already in the air when they say it. Mm-hmm. This is becoming like a little child. Trust, living in the moment. My dad will catch me. How do you know? Well, he's my dad and he'll catch me. Now, that's not proof. That's faith. And this is what children live in. They live in a world of faith. And so the Lord's saying, unless you turn from the focus on self and repent, the kingdom of God, the reign of heaven is at hand. So turn and become like a child. And you'll never enter the kingdom because you need to humble yourself like this child. And and looking at this entering the kingdom, you know, well, when do we enter the reign of God? God brings it to the earth. God brings it into creation. You know, we pray the Lord's Prayer, thy kingdom come. Well, the kingdom of God comes indeed without our prayer. We're actually come among us. Well, the reign of God is what we're talking about. We want God to reign in our lives. We want God to reign in our priorities. And that requires us to humble ourselves like a little child, to turn. And this is the reign of God, that we let God rule. And, and we can only do that once the Holy Spirit opens our eyes to the truth and turns our hearts back to God. You know, the turn me and I shall be turned, as the psalmist puts it. Well, the Lord turns us. He does. And then we turn. And, and this is, again, the gift of God at work in us, is we don't turn ourselves to God. God turns us to himself. And he does that first by sending his son. And, and when God loved us so much that he sent his son, he showed us what he was willing to do to turn us. He was willing to give everything. And then out of his great love, he even turns us. You know, Ephesians 5, where Paul uses that, that image of Christ preparing for himself his bride, the church. He washed her. He cleansed her. He purified her. The church mm-hmm. didn't purify itself. Christ turns us. And so when he says, unless you turn, he's actually talking about the work of the Holy Spirit in God's people. John chapter 3 again, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, that which is born of the spirit is spirit. And so this child depends and, and learns from the parent who teaches. And who's our parent? God is our father. Christ is our brother. And so God teaches us to become like a little child, like Jesus himself, who says, Father, not my will, but yours be done at the end of the time in the garden. So some of the stuff about this, this statement here is, is about Jesus as much as it is about the disciples. I have to become first, Jesus says, like a little child myself. I turn and I humble myself. And now who's the greatest? Well, Christ Jesus is. And yet in Christ Jesus, we are his people. We are made one. So and that's a little deeper than you probably were going, but that's okay. Not at all. It is absolutely pure gold, Pastor. And I'm reminded of the small catechism when it says, Thy kingdom come, the second petition. And, and you, you said this beautifully. This is what I love about Pastor Tice, is he can speak it in a language that, that we all can understand, and I have to repeat it from the small catechism. But the second petition, Thy kingdom come, how does God's kingdom come? God's kingdom comes when our Heavenly Father gives us His Holy Spirit, and that's what you emphasized, turns us by the Holy Spirit so that His grace, we believe His Holy Word and the godly lives here in time and there in eternity. So, so Pastor, I want to ask this question, and just to try to uh, um, really get down to confirmation level, that's kind of where I operate in most of my life, is mm-hmm. when he says, unless you turn and become like children, the obvious question is, well, how do we do this? You know, this is like John chapter 3, you know, like you said, well, how can I go back into my mother's womb and be born again? So, so like you said so beautifully that God is the one, Jesus is the one who turns, humbles himself to the point of the cross, and then he is the greatest. So what does that mean for me? Then the question comes again, I know it does in my own heart. Well, then how do I then therefore turn and become like a child? What does that look like in today's world, Pastor? Well, I think one of the ways it looks like is we ask, how can I help other people? And I'm going to you know, I'm gonna pick on a, a really sore and, and sensitive subject, and that's this question of, of wearing masks. You know, uh, statistical research indicates that masks have a particular value, and it's a very small value. 
but its value is to keep me from infecting others if I have the right mask and I use it properly. The rest of the time, a mask is a pain for me. It's an aggravation. But if I think I might be around someone whom I'm aware of has a Im- compromised immune system, I will wear the mask, not for me, but for them. I don't think the masks are worth a whole lot, except for keeping me from spreading something. And so if I know someone has a compromised immune system, I'm going to wear the mask even if I don't think I need it, even though I know I have no symptoms of of any infectious disease. But I'll wear the mask because that's how I serve the other person. And it's really not about me. And, 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 you know, I can get into the political discussion of, of who has authority, but that's really not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about how do I serve my neighbor? How do I love my neighbors myself? And, and what it means sometimes is I wear the mask, even though I know it's, it's got no real function beyond serving my neighbor, I'll wear the mask. And, and see, this is one of those places where, as a theologian, as a Christian, I can sit down and say, yeah, I think masks are, are mostly unnecessary, but I won't tell people don't wear them, because that would harm my neighbor who actually needs me to protect him or her. See, and, and this, is, this is the tough part. It's never, it's never cut and dried. It's always, how do I love my neighbors myself? It's not a book mm-hmm. where you pull, pull out the page and say, and today this is how you do it. No. What does your neighbor need? How do you meet that need? Oh, well, go ahead. And part of this, I mean, and, and, that's, and I appreciate the tension that you're living with there is the question of how do I serve my neighbor in this scenario? And, and we pray for the Holy Spirit, as, as the small catechism, you know, emphasizes, pray for the Holy Spirit to have us turn, be like children, living in the moment, trusting in the Lord. I don't know if I want to, I, I should try this with my dad, you know, jump in the air and see if my dad will catch me next time I see him. No, um, but, but to <laughs> be able to <laughs> mine, trust mine him. I guarantee it. <laughs> <laughs> but to trust him in that moment, and we pray for the Holy Spirit to renew our faith at the same time ask, how can I serve my neighbor? And so, Pastor, I think he really pulls that forward um, from that point and then points us to how we receive a child. But we need to get to our break right now. We are studying Matthew chapter 18 with Pastor Stephen Tice, and we will be right back. These are the voices of young Lutherans in Mexico City, children who are excited to learn more about their Savior, Jesus. But they need our help because good Lutheran books for kids in the Spanish language are in short supply in Mexico. To learn how you can help tell Spanish-speaking kids everywhere about Jesus in a language they can understand, go to the Lutheran Heritage Foundation website at lhfmissions.org forward slash Juan 316. And welcome back. We are studying Matthew chapter 18 with Pastor Stephen Tice of Emmanuel Lutheran Church in New Wells, Illinois. And Pastor, we have, we have been brought forward of, of our natural inclination to ask the question, who is the greatest? Who would get the most votes of the disciples? Who would get the most votes at our, at our church, maybe our home, whatever it might be, to be mm-hmm. the, the favorite one? And then he plops that child in the middle and calls them to repentance, which... He then therefore calls you and I to repentance, because if we, we, how can we not look at the cross and ask the question, who is the greatest? And if the answer is not Jesus, then we are, are, we are lost and we have no hope, which we know that mm-hmm. we do. So, so Pastor, anything else in the first four verses as we, he kind of makes a little bit of transition in five and six. Sure. Well, he uses the phrase, whoever humbles himself. Uh, this, this is a, an inclusive there's no one who will be excluded who humbles oneself before God. It isn't a question of performance or lineage or possessions or, or any of those things. It isn't even a question of how long one has lived apart from God. Whoever humbles himself is the greatest in the kingdom. And so this is uh, the thief on the cross. Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. I mean, 
he, he pretty much said, I believe you're the king. I believe, I believe whatever, <laughs> whatever is going on, you're bringing it. So, Lord, remember me. Well, this is, you know, this is a guy that humbles himself and literally becomes like a little child while dying on the cross. This is, this is pretty serious for us to recognize that the moment it happens, God's at work doing it. And it doesn't matter when the moment is, God's still going to bless the one who receives this condition of repentance. So I just thought I'd connect that thought right there. And, I mean, the, this, this whole text, how, how could we not think of humility? You know, humble thyself mm-hmm. in the sight of the Lord, as, as I remember a song we would sing at camp and, and so forth, is just that understanding of when we actually look at what Jesus is saying, how could we not... Um, we pray that we would not ask the question at the end of it. So who's the greatest again? Like what's, what's going on? You know, that we keep our eyes centered on the cross. So five and six, Mm -hmm. like I said, is a little bit of a transition as we hear Jesus continue to teach. Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones to believe in me to sin it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and to be drowned in the depth of the sea. Now, Pastor, I want to keep the millstone aside for a moment. We have, we're going to sure. get there. I just don't want to quite, because that, that's the, something oh, no. where our hearts naturally go to. But verse 5, he says, Whoever receives one child such in my name receives me. And, yeah. and what does he mean by that? What, what is he trying to get across here? Well, he's, he's getting, getting across... The fact that God God recognizes each child, each human being as someone of value, and it's not a question of what influence they might have or what they can do for you. It's a question of who God sees them to be, and and each one is God's creation. And so as we look at this little child, Jesus says, whoever receives a child does it because they see this person through spiritual eyes, if you will, through the realization that all of us are created by God, and Christ died to redeem all of us. There, you know, God is not willing that any should perish. And so if you're, if you're willing to receive a little child who can't do a thing for you and won't bring you any great benefits, and to be honest, sometimes a little child in your life is a bit of a challenge and, and almost a taxing difficulty for your own routines and schedule, you know? We've, we both raised children, so we're talking yep, about yep. the same subject here, okay? <laughs> when, when, we, when we do that, God says, you're showing that you're willing to suffer for the good of others, which is what Christ does for us. And in so doing, we are acting like our Heavenly Father, in that we mm. don't hold back love from one who is not able to reciprocate it in a way that benefits us in a uh, tangible or measurable way. I mean, the reciprocation of love from children is great, but it's, you know, it's different than measurable. So, it, Absolutely. And, and as we look at this, there's that... Um, in my name receives me. And how could we not then look at Matthew 25 when Jesus, you know, separates the sheep from the goats and, yeah. and says, you know, when I was hungry, you fed me. And, and when I was naked, you clothed me type of language. And so it really brings this um, service to children in once, you know, in a sense. I, I'm reminded of this a little bit, and this is a practical um, situation where I, there, one of our members has four children. I, you know, they're like third grade down to newborn, so they're they're a busy family. And the mother flew up from Texas, and I was just talking to the mother a little bit, and she was just, and then the the um, the grandmother, excuse me, and they were talking about how she just plays with the kids all day long. It's just like eight in the morning until ten at night. She's just playing with the kids, getting on their level, and and loving on her grandkids, and that just kind of reminds me a little bit of what Jesus's call here is, is to receive them, to be at their level and, and to, um, well, serve as our Lord has called us to serve. So that's just a reminder for us of those little vocational moments that our Lord gives to us to serve and to love, and then reminds us of the humility of Christ to come down on our level as well. So that's verse five. Anything else on that? Because the next step is the danger of causing these little ones to stumble. So mm-hmm. anything else in verse five? Well, there, there are two things. One is, as whoever receives one child in my name is dealing with my name, receives me. And receiving mm-hmm. it in the name of the ruler of heaven, because we've been talking about the kingdom of heaven or the reign of God coming here. And so you're using the name of the reign, the reigning one, the, the ruler, whose heavenly father just said, this is my beloved son, listen to him in the transfiguration. So we have this, this statement that says, you mentioned it in my name from Matthew 25. The in my name part 
is a relationship we have now because we've been named God's children in the name of the mm-hmm. Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit in baptism, but named part of God's family. You know, once you are no people, now you are my people. This is, this is the, the key understanding, that we do it as who we are in Christ Jesus, and therefore we do it in his name. And it's, it's the extension of God in, in the world. And that's what I love about, I've heard different um, work projects that I've seen uh, people do. And, and one of their common statements is that we're serving this community in the name of Jesus. And I think that's just a good, re- a good reminder for us as we serve. Um, and also a reminder of, you know, that we as Christians do so everything in his name. And then Jesus gets to this next part. That basically shows us, he shows us the seriousness of sin, the seriousness of causing others to sin, and uses some very, well, very terrifying kind of mobster type of threats. Um, that if you don't do this, then you may as well do this. I mean, this is like Jimmy Hoffa, you know, where, mm-hmm. where is he? Kind of, kind of fearful tactics here, which is kind of hits, hits our ears a little strangely. Um, this is serious stuff. What is Jesus telling us? He's, he's saying that we have this relationship based on who God is, not on who we are. And, and so when we talk about this little child, greatest in the kingdom of heaven, then putting that child in danger means we're ridiculing heaven. We're ridiculing the reign of God. And, and we look at the whole understanding of the millstone to recognize that there's a couple of things to, to identify. One's very simple. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me, who has faith in me, you know, the verb there, uh, means to, to have faith, to believe. So Jesus is saying, little children have faith. Now, we don't know how old this little child was, but it was a little kid, so children believe in Jesus. And, and you know, I'm, I'm going out on a limb and saying, I'm going to guess the child was under the age of 10, maybe under the age of 6. But mm-hmm. I guarantee you, it was, it was not a teenager. This was a little child. This was a young child. And in, in so doing, he's saying, the little one believes in me, but if you cause one to sin, well, how do you cause one to sin? You put them in a situation, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. Okay, speaking as a father, I know there were times I probably provoked my children to anger. And then when they were angry, they sinned because I provoked them. Did I do it on purpose? Probably not. Did I do it in, in, in perhaps negligence? Yeah, very likely. And so, hmm, boy, that's not good. And so I, I go to the Lord and ask for forgiveness, but also go to my children. And, and as, as parents, my wife and I have done this with our kids. We have on, on various occasions gone to them and said, I'm sorry what I did was wrong or what I said wasn't right. Please forgive me. I mean, we've, we've confessed that it was sinful and asked for forgiveness and, and practice forgiveness in the house. Well, what Jesus is saying is if you're in a situation where you cause someone who is in God's household to sin, the consequences are serious. And now, it would be better. What would be better than to cause one to sin would be to have your life ended. Now, Mm. notice it doesn't say to be sent to hell. It says for your life to end. Now, the the, uh, thing that struck me as I was reading this was the previous section where he has Peter catching a fish. It's the exact same word. You know, cast your hook in the sea and pull out a fish, the first fish you catch. And it's the same place. The sea is a source of rescue uh, when the fish is caught with the shekel in it. And now the this, this sea is a source for, for a consequence of, of perishing when one disregards the spiritual needs of others. And so that, that God can use the same source as a blessing that will then become a place for um, one to be swallowed up. And, and the size of the millstone, you know, depending or fastened, hanging down from your neck is what it literally says. The word fastened is a bit, it's an accurate way of presenting it, but it literally means hanging down off your, off your neck. And, and you, can't, you can't carry that millstone around. It's too big to carry. It weighs, you know, weighs more than a ton. So this is, this is called, in the water, you're going straight down. So, if, you're, if you go in the water, there's no chance that's right. um, of it's, survival. And, and, yeah. and he shows the seriousness of sin. And later on, he'll show the seriousness of sin for oneself, but also the seriousness of others, which is why, like you said so well here today, is that need for repentance for the kingdom of God is at hand. 
I mean, this is not like there's some far off reality. And it's good for us to remember this too, that the Lord is at work in our lives. Faith is real. The resurrection is real. The, 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 the salvation is ours. It is right mm-hmm. here. It's been won for us with Christ. And so this is serious business, not something like a, a pump up session at a, at a school where you're just trying to make people feel better for the day. This is life or death, heaven or hell stuff that we are dealing with. And so sins need repentance. They need forgiveness. And and he's just really bringing that to the forefront where it's not, not how do you call it, like soft, uh, wimpy Jesus in this. Mm-hmm. This is, yeah. he is being very real with these folks at this moment. So Pastor, anything else before we get to the temptations to sin? Anything else in the first six verses? I think I think part of what I said earlier is the, this. It's not hyperbole. It has a shock value, and we'll see that repeated again. This would be the kind of thing that immediately gets the attention of the disciples to, for for lack of a better word, to step back and ask, "Wow, I've never considered it that big of a deal." And this this well, is a way of saying, "Pay attention. This matters." And I'll say this too. One thing I've noticed in the transitions that the last number of chapters, and I'd have to do a little more research on this. I want to say eh, end of 16. I'm kind of looking real quickly here. Basically, towards the end of 16 until now, Jesus is teaching his disciples. Before this point, he does a lot of teaching among the scribes, the Pharisees, Mm -hmm. and the Sadducees. Now, and we can do this too, he, we can get caught up in saying, boy, it's a good thing we're not like them, you know, yeah. um, where you say, well, that church doesn't mm-hmm. believe in the resurrection or that church doesn't believe in this or that church doesn't believe in the word of God. Um, whatever it might be, we can still focus on that, that we're not even looking at ourselves. So Jesus is transitioning, getting closer to this cross, especially foretelling his death and resurrection, that he's pointing at them, his followers, those who uh, have faith and are following him, you know, you are ones who have to take this serious as well. It's too easy to, you know, beat up on the people that are over there. Now it's time Mm -hmm. for us to know this is for you. So that's one transition that I've seen Jesus make in these last few chapters. But Pastor, let's get to the last part, which really brings it to the forefront. I mean, he's, he's not even looking at a little kid anymore. He's looking right at them. And we'll read the rest of these verses, verses seven through nine. Woe to the world for temptations to sin, for it is necessary that temptations come, but woe to the one by whom the temptation comes. You know what? I'm going to stop there, Pastor, because there's enough there for for a long time. So a minute or two, he says, woe to the world for Mm -hmm. temptations. We know of temptations in the scriptures. Jesus was tempted. Um, What is he warning them about with temptations? Well, he's warning warning them that that they can be part of the process, that they can become part of the... uh, the way of, of getting in someone's someone's path and tripping them, causing them to stumble. stumble. And um, he, he, he uses a verb there when it says it is necessary. It's not the usual verb that we see for most times when we hear necessary. This is, it's, it's almost like it's, it's obligatory. It's under compulsion. It's, it's being pushed. And Satan is the one who's pushing it, not God. And see, this is, this is why woe to the one from whom the temptation comes. Because God indeed tempts no one, but, you know, we are tempted by our own sinful nature. And so what are we asking here? We're asking that God be, a, be able to help us see temptation so we can avoid it. But also, Jesus is saying, the world is going to be tempted. Woe to the world for temptation to sin. This, this means it's coming. Temptation is coming. The cosmos is going to suffer. And, and Adam and Eve were tempted. What does Scripture say? Temptation led to sin. So in our time, temptation will lead to sin. And it happens in my life. It happens in your life. And, and so what Jesus is saying is, don't be the one that brings it into someone else's life. It's going to happen anyway, because Satan's out to get you. But don't become part of the process. And, and this, this word then, woe to the one by whom the temptation comes. It's also a condemnation of Satan. Mm, yeah. One of those things we, we tend to overlook here is that Satan's already condemned, and, and there are Again, getting back to this reality, life is all spiritual. Evil, evil spirits hang around Jesus at times and, and inflict others, and, and they can hear what Jesus is saying, too. And so he's saying, beyond his own disciples, he's condemning temptation from Satan. But for us as Christians, when he gets to this physical application, now he's moved from the, the broad to the, the very narrow. Woe to the world. It's necessary, but woe to the one by whom the temptation comes, and then he narrows it right down on you and me. It goes from the, the broad 
the general, the specific comes next, and now it's about me personally. Jesus does take out any any assumptions that we might have that temptation will not be part of the Christian life. If anything, mm-hmm. temptation might be greater because the devil knows that you are marked in the name of Jesus, like you said, as one baptized into Christ. And 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 Jesus uh, the, the, in the Lord's Prayer, you know, we say in the small catechism, once again, you know, lead us not into temptation. What does this mean? God tempts no one. So once again, th- th- he brings us back to the devil, that woe to the devil for doing this. And we pray that God would guard and keep us so that the devil, the world, and our sinful nature may not be deceived or deceive us or mislead us into false belief, despair, and other great shame and vice. And he reminds us that this is part of our prayer as well. Jesus is calling us to pray, Lord, um, deliver us from evil. You know, lead us not into Mm -hmm. temptation, but deliver us from evil. So, we're not. If, if you get tempted, this is not a sign that God is against you. It's a sign the devil is attacking and the Lord promises to be able to withstand, help us to be steadfast through that temptation. Mm-hmm. So I think it's a very, he just is very real in this, in this verse as well. Um, any last thoughts on that before we get to the rest? Uh, just just that, that the temptation is necessary. It's going to happen. So you and I know right. it's already coming. It's under compulsion, if you will, is uh, another way to translate that. So it's it's inevitable. Verses eight and nine, you know, okay, so temptations are there. What does he tell us to do when we are tempted? Verses eight and nine. And if your hand or foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter a life crippled or lame than with two hands or two feet to be thrown into the internal fire. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into the hell of fire. Now, Pastor, this is reminiscent of Matthew 5 with the Sermon on the Mount, where he uses basically the same language and tells them of the seriousness of sin, tells us mm-hmm. the seriousness of sin, and, and uses physical language to do it. Um, how do we teach this correctly so that people are... Um, Taking it serious, but also not doing something that's maybe not correct as far as how sure. we see all of Scripture. Well, I think first do a little bit of, of grammatical analysis of the sentence structure. And if your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. That's a contrary to fact and additional clause, because your hand or your foot doesn't cause you to sin. It's your heart that causes you to sin. Out of the heart come evil thoughts. Jesus says that himself. So sure. the idea that your hand or your foot caused you to sin If it did, cutting it off and throwing it away would be the right response. Because it's better to enter life crippled or lame, or with two hands to be thrown into the eternal fire. Now that that has an assumption that says what we do in this world to our bodies now will continue. No, that's not what Jesus is saying. What Jesus is saying is the physical present world is real, but it will change when I come at the end of the age. And so rather than saying, well, in this life I have to have a whole body, no, in this life you have to have a whole relationship with me. So if your physical situation is causing you to sin, separate yourself from the physical situation. You know, deliver us from evil is another thing we say in the Lord's Prayer. And I've always said the Lord does that one of two ways. He either takes the evil away from us or he takes us away from the evil. And Jesus is sort of implying that when he says, if your hand, your foot, is, your eye is the problem, cut it off. Now, we have this challenge that we hear the cruel and unusual punishment aspect of this. And there's some people who say, well, it's hyperbole. Jesus didn't really mean that. Well, I'm not saying he didn't mean it. I'm saying whether he meant it literally or not, the shock value is real. What he meant you to hear him say was, your body is not as important as your spiritual eternity. So deal with the most important thing. Let that be your priority. He doesn't say ignore your body. He says make your eternal life the greatest priority. And so if your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. You know, this cruel and unusual punishment concept that we get from the U.S. Constitution prohibiting it. You know, in the ancient culture there was a time, some parts of the world it's still true, where if you were engaged in a particular illegal activity like theft or whatever, they cut your hand off. Well, it marks you as a thief, it prevents you from doing gainful employment, and it really, really teaches you not to steal again. But the thing is, it doesn't fix anything. It doesn't reverse anything. 
So what God calls us to is to recognize that the eternal relationship with him is the one that matters most. And if our physical situation is keeping us from our spiritual healthiness, we need to give up the physical to have the spiritual. And sometimes that means not being the greatest, being the servant of all. You know, the two things are, I'm going to use the word, two facets of the same coin. I don't want to say two sides of the same coin, but they're two facets of the same coin. That, That the spiritual presupposition that people might have is that to be to be right to be good to be best i need to have all these things and god keeps saying no look at it from my perspective what matters most your permanent relationship with me and then you know jesus statement to peter in in the previous chapter you know take the shekel so as not to give offense give him the money but the son is free the son does not pay the tax and so this is partly tied to this idea that that we are god's children and the little child you know, receiving me, receives one in my name, it's better for you to enter life crippled. If your eye causes you to sin, tear it out, throw it away. Well, your eye is damaged by sin. You know, and, and again, Scripture talks about that, that the, the eye lets into the heart what's there. And, and in this process, if the eye is corrupting the heart, destroying the spirit, the eye should go. Now, radical surgery. You know, it's, it's, it's like removing a cancerous or gangrene limb. It'll kill you if you don't get rid of it, so you cut it off. You cut out that, that cancerous tumor. It's not pleasant. It's not fun. It's necessary. And to a large extent, what Jesus is getting at is what's necessary for you to enter the kingdom of heaven? What's necessary for you to enter eternal life instead of be thrown into eternal fire? And so this shock value, as I said earlier, gets the message across. Does Jesus tell anybody to to mutilate themselves? No. Does Jesus tell anybody they're rewarded for mutilating themselves? Absolutely not. What does Jesus say? It's better to enter eternal life than to any other way exist. doesn't matter what the physical is. If you don't have eternal life, the physical is not going to do you any good ultimately. And so this is, again, back to our priorities as human beings, as Christians, in our daily life, our daily walk. What are we asking? Well, the world offers us all kinds of things. And by the world, I mean the physical world and Satan and and the culture around us offers us wonderful things. If only we give up. You know, the temptation of Jesus. Bow down and worship me. I'll give you all the splendor of the world. Mm. Yeah, well, is that a good thing to have instead of eternal life with God? No. Looks good at the moment. You know, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. Good for food, good to eat, pleasant to look at. You know, the recurring pattern of Satan's temptation is always the same, and so you and I have to struggle with it. What is it that I have to see in the world around me? What is, what is a blessing from God can become a temptation if I let it take over my relationship with, with God's calling to me as his child? And, and so is work a good thing? Yes. Is there such a thing as too much of a good thing? Yes. So what do I do? Is physical health good? Yeah, it is. Two hands going to hell good? No, it isn't. So what's more important? How do you prioritize? And so as Christians, we're called to ask, what is God's priority here? And as a Christian individually, I have to ask that for myself. You know, daily I must die to sin and a new man come forth, as the catechism puts it. Scripture says, you know, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? The good I want to do, I don't do. The evil I want to do, I end up doing. Well, thanks be to God, it's in Christ Jesus that I have victory, that I have rescue, that I have peace. And so I don't have to be the greatest. Christ is the greatest for me, and therefore I get his righteousness. And now God counts me as good in his eyes. And that's what matters. I've heard it once in a sermon. Actually, I read it. It was Dr. Norman Nagel wrote a sermon Mm -hmm. that, that continuously throughout the sermon, he said, wrong question. Yeah. And, and, and you really brought us around to that original question, who is the greatest? And, and the question they should have asked really is, is Jesus the greatest? You know, um, mm-hmm. and, 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 and then that brings with it the answers that are obvious. But as with the answer that is just that obvious, yes, the rest of this shows us if Jesus is the greatest, you know, we receive this child. If Jesus is the greatest, we'll do anything we can to make sure that we stay in a relationship with him, trusting that he is the one who overcame temptation and, and all of that. So it's it's a common question that people will say, something along the lines of, um, 
that uh so is jesus telling me to cut off my my leg and our answer to that is too quickly to answer the question on their grounds which is well Mm -hmm. no jesus isn't saying that well that's once again it's the wrong question the question is Mm -hmm. is jesus the greatest and if that's yes then your answer will be appropriate to what we're hearing today pastor we have 30 seconds left in our time how do you want to um summarize all this and bring it back together well i think it all comes back to this the lord says that his word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path, and to recognize that as long as we let the, the word of God direct us, he will show us how we are to follow him. And, and it's always this question of what is God teaching me here? And what God teaches us in this particular section is don't have worldly or human-based priorities. Find God's priorities and let them be the ones that guide your living because they're already right for you. And so in God's word, we'll find what's already right for us. We simply need to read, and the Holy Spirit will guide us to it, because that's where Jesus says, you'll find eternal life. It's in here. It's me. Search it. Your word is truth. Pastor Stephen Tice of Emmanuel Lutheran Church in New Wells, Missouri, giving us God's strong word from Matthew chapter 18. Pastor Tice, thank you for bringing us his gifts. Thank you, Brady. It was my pleasure. I'm your host, Brady Finneran, pastor of Messiah Lutheran Church in Sartell, Minnesota. Thank you for joining us, and the Lord keep you safe in the palm of his hands.